Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God has work for his people to do. And when we say yes to the calling of God in our life, be assured that we will be individuals who are recipients of God's provision. The last several weeks, I've mentioned frequently God's provision. And the truth of the matter is that we can't do anything that's pleasing to God We can't bear that fruit that we are called to unless, first, we are recipients of his provision. And not just being a recipient, but a good steward of what he has provided. And as we've learned last week, when we do act in obedience, we are those good stewards of what God has given, and we're committed to the things that God has called us to do. God will give more. God will also lift us up. He will give us a greater amount of revelation. We will see things from his vantage point so that we can be a greater influencer, that we can have a greater impact upon our homes, our communities, upon others, that others might be drawn into the same calling that we have received, and that is to be servants of the living God. That should be what our desires are, to simply serve God and bring to Him honor and glory in carrying out His purposes. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 36. Now, we've been sharing much for many, many weeks, a few months even, about the tabernacle, a place of worship where the children of Israel and others who were brought into the family of Israel by faith, by commitment, by a desire to acknowledge the one true God, where they would worship. So it was a place of assembly where they worship God. And nothing has changed. Even in our days, God is calling into his family more and more people from every race, every nation, every tribe, every tongue that they might know salvation. And as a response from being safe, the natural flow from that is worship. People who have been redeemed, are drawn close to God, and when you are drawn into intimacy with Him, the natural expression is worship. And when we desire that He be worship, God, God is going to move mightily. And that's what we're seeing here in this chapter. So once more, the book of Exodus, chapter 36. The emphasis here is these individuals that God has called in a unique way to participate in the establishment of the Mishkan, the tabernacle that was in the wilderness and ultimately made its way into the land of Israel to a place called Shiloh. Verse 1, chapter 36. And Betzael and Aholiav, and every one, literally every man of a wise heart. And how do they have this wise heart? Which the Lord placed. He gave to these individuals who are mentioned here. He gave them wisdom and understanding. He placed it in these, for what purpose? Keep reading. To know and to do 
everything in regard to the work of the holy service, all which the Lord commanded. So the message is simple. And this is a principle that goes beyond just tabernacle or later on temple worship. It's a principle that even today is in force, and it's this. When we are committed to the purpose of God, God will supply wisdom and understanding. He will place it in our heart, that is, so that we think wisely, that we think with understanding so that we can, and here's the key, that we not only know, but also, he says, to know and to do. And this is where it gets critical. Do you have a desire to do the work of God? See, many people, they want to experience God working in their life according to how they want God to perform for them. That is a form of idolatry. Now, they might use that that name of God. They might call on the name of Yeshua. They might say many good things. They may quote frequently from the scripture, but in the end, the problem is that they want God to do their work. That is not spirituality. That is not an outcome of faith. In fact, it's the opposite of that. It is faithlessness. These people, they want to know, understand the will of God. So, and what it says here, is that they might do, and notice what it says, to do all the labor, all the work, the holy service, all what the Lord commanded. And because of that, look now to verse 2. And Moses called Betsael and Aholiav, and to every one, this is the word man, but in this case, it's every one of a wise heart, and once more it says, which the Lord place wisdom in that heart, and all which, and here's the key, his heart lifted him up. Now, this is not simply a term of motivation, but it's a term of a new perspective. The heart lifted him up, not simply for the sake of being encouraged or motivated, but having a new vantage point, seeing things in how God wants us to perceive so that we can act in faithfulness to, and here's the key, to his revelation. This is a wise prayer. We should be people who pray, God, give me insight. Grant me this wisdom and understanding and a perspective, your perspective, knowing your will so that I can know and do. These are the people that God is, is using in order to accomplish his purpose. Everyone whose heart has lifted him up to draw near to, and this drawing near is to the work to the labor, and notice what it says, and this is the second time, to do it. Now, there's no mistake. There is an emphasis in this text on doing. Now, realize the order. These people have been redeemed by the blood of the land, the paradigm from the exodus of Egypt. It teaches us about the true work of redemption, not through the blood of lambs, the Passover lamb, but based upon the blood of the true Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua. And having been redeemed eternally, that's what the scripture says, and I don't know why people want to set that aside, that God has purchased for us eternal redemption. And because of that, I have been changed, you have been changed, every believer has. And the true testimony of that change is we have turned away from our objectives, and in doing so, God has given us a new perspective, his perspective, and now we want to carry it out. 
And because we can't do it in and of ourselves, he supplies this wisdom and understanding once more in order for us to do this holy service, to do his labor. Verse 3. And they took from before Moses all of these individuals motivated by the right thing, lifted up by their heart, being recipients of wisdom and understanding. These individuals took from before Moses all the donation which the children of Israel brought for the work. Now, they took it from Moses, all which the people of Israel donated, gave as the donation unto the Lord, but it had a a designation for the work that we're talking about now, tabernacle work. And what's the motivation of tabernacle work? That is, what is its purpose? Well, we can summarize it with one word, worship. They wanted the people to worship God and to do so as he instructed. And this has major implications. We need to understand that worship is always done based upon God's instruction. If we're not worshiping God in a submissive manner to his revelation, then once again, it's not worship. It is idolatry, and that's why more and more today, as people turn away from this book, they're casual with the word, and they they want to do what? They want to share their thoughts. And more and more, we see individuals twisting the scripture in order that the people might get excited. But the problem is this. They're getting excited based upon a misrepresentation of God. They're getting excited because they're hearing God wants to fulfill their will. That's a lie. God is not interested in your plans, your program, your objectives. He's interested in a perfect plan, and that's his plan. And it's just so discouraging to see one after another going after this false worship rather than learning the principles of the Scripture. These people, they were committed to do the Lord's labor, the holy service. And once more, notice what it says in verse 3, la sot ota, to do it. Now, we've seen this word la sot, to do, and to do it three times and then two times, meaning three times the word to do has appeared. And to do it, meaning the sacred service, has appeared twice. And it's all to emphasize. And notice, this word for sacred or holy service, it has to do with a purpose, God's purpose. That's why it's so important that we we look at things in the source language. Because what we hear as holy may not be what God sees as holy. Holiness is always connected to the will, the purposes of God, not your desires or my desires. So these people are committed to it, and notice what it says at the end of verse 3. And they brought unto him, now remember last week, at the end of chapter 35, that last section, We saw eight times and perhaps nine, if we deal with the women and their response, but eight times in a generic way, in a general way, the people brought, and guess what? They're still doing it. Their heart of generosity continues. To the extent, look at the end of verse 3, and they brought unto him, that is, unto Moses, Od nedava, more donation, more generosity, baboker, baboker. Now, many of you know the word boker is morning. Baboker in the morning and in the morning, meaning each and every morning. They brought another donation. And the word here for donation is the word for generosity. 
They gave not because they were compelled by the word, but they gave because they were compelled by a generous spirit. They wanted to give more and more. And to the extent, keep reading verse 4, and they brought all these wise ones who were doing all the sacred work. Every man from his work, what happens? Well, what it says here, and I believe I translated wrong, look again to verse 4, they came. So in verse 4, they came, all the wise ones, the ones who were doing all the sacred work, every man from his work, meaning they came from doing the work. And they came before Moses, and they wanted to say something. It says, those who were doing, they said, now verse 5, they said to Moses, they spoke to Moses saying, Marbim ha'am lavi midei ha'avodah la malacha asher tziva shem la'asot ota. Which means, the people, this is what these wise ones who are doing the work are saying to Moses. The people, and this is word for multiplying. And in this case, it means to ever increasingly multiply, doing it each and every day. The people are multiplying to bring more than sufficient for the work, for this lake labor which the Lord commanded. And here's now the third time we have la sotota to do it. Now, one of the things that, that this passage is saying concerning the wise ones who are carrying out the work, it's telling them and telling us that they are individuals that are committed to do it, the sacred labor. This purpose fulfilled the purpose of God. They are committed, they are passionate about doing this work. This work that reflects the purpose of God. And they are being interrupted because people are coming, giving more and more to the extent that what has been given is more than sufficient for the work that God has called them to do, the amount of it. Verse 6, And Moses commanded, and they, they passed a voice, meaning they herald. It's literally the word for a voice passing through, so it's an announcement that passed through, notice it says, Ba machade, passed through the camp, saying, Ish ve isha. Now, I like this because in this, this passage that deals with worship, we see that men are mentioned, but also women. And when we look at the text, when we look here, it says, men and women do not do any more this labor. Now, what labor are they speaking of? The labor that had to do with, with collecting the donations, going out, collecting it and bringing it to the ones who were carrying out the labor. So a, a herald went forth throughout the camp saying to every man and every woman, do not do any longer this labor for this holy donation. And the people finished bringing it. They brought an end to bringing these donations anymore. Now, what a testimony. These people in the wilderness, they were committed to worshiping God. Now, in the book of Exodus, we see something. We're coming towards the end. We're getting ready for tabernacle worship. And this involves a change. A change in how the people worship God. It took them to a new level. A new type of worship based upon a revelation of a higher spiritual level. And this was all brought about because of two things. They had a desire to worship God, and they wanted to do it, to do this service. And it was based upon this generous spirit that, that, that gave them this, this passion for a fulfillment of what God was commanding the people. So we need to ask ourselves, 
Am I someone that's really committed to fulfilling what God has said? This is what brought this unique situation of these people at this time. Look at verse 7. And the work was more than sufficient for all the labor, and here's the fourth time, to do it and even more so. There is an abundance. There is a surplus. And that's simply how God moves. When God is submitted to, when God's purposes are the objectives, we will see that God supplies more than is sufficient. That's his nature. And we see that, for example, in the book of, of Luke in chapter 6, where it speaks about God and his blessings, that they are, are, are pressed down and full and and also overflowing. That's how God gives, in abundance. And that should be our generous nature as well. Because this God that does more than sufficient, he dwells within us, his spirit does. And that should be our nature, and that's what testified. This passage testifies to concerning the giving of the people. Well, let's move now to our, our second session section in this this passage which is the establishment of the tabernacle and this is going to remind us of all the material and what was needed and how the tabernacle was uh, established how it was erected it has not been done but it's going to be done and he's emphasizing once more all the methodology for the building, the establishment of the tabernacle. So let's begin. We'll complete that next week, but let's begin now. Look at verse 8. And every wise-hearted one did the ones who were doing the labor in regard to the tabernacle. Now, when we look at here, we see the doers of the labor and what did the doers of labors do? Well, that's exactly what the scripture says. It says, they did all these wise ones who had that wise heart, the ones who were doing the labor of the tabernacle. And notice how once more what we've already studied is repeated. And whenever something is repeated, there is an emphasis. There is a message for the reader. And notice what God says here. He begins by saying in this erecting of the tabernacle, there's going to be 10, 10 curtains or screens. And they're going to be made of a, a twisted linen and also of other materials. What we've talked about so much, techelet, that turquoise, that, that unique blue and that royal purple and also scarlet. And then at the end of verse 8, there's an emphasis on the kruvim. These are the cherubim. And we know that the cherubim are related to the Ark of the Covenant, but also in a unique way, they appear upon the curtain in a unique location. So God is telling them, these are the elements of the tabernacle, that primary structure. Now we're going to see in the conclusion of our study tonight that there was also a tent a covering over the tabernacle but right now we're talking about the tabernacle structure which consisted of 10 curtains made of this twisted linen this uh, turquoise this purple this crimson and notice it says the the cherubim that were masse choshev they were of a design work, a work that required thinking. That's literally what the word choshev means. And it speaks about that they reflected the consideration of God, what he wanted to convey in this tabernacle. And it says once more, these ones with a wise heart, it says, and he did them, meaning made them. Who's that? Well, all under the 
workmanship, the authority of Moses, and also of Bethsael. Verse 9. Now we're going to learn that the, the length of these curtains, one curtain is 28 cubics. Now, 28 is an interesting number in the Scripture. Because 28, we see it consisting of 8, which is this newness, but the number 20. What we find here is that the number 20 relates to, well, when we break it up, we see that it's two tens. And we're going to see that when people worship, and the number two usually speaks of, and ten is complete, entirety, this is what happens. When people go before God to worship, expect something. Expect a change. I go, I may have the best intention in worshiping God. But I'm going to go there with, and one of the things we've learned is this. By, by worship, one of the byproducts is revelation. We've seen that in the scripture many times. The people worship, and God gives revelation. And 28 tells us that there's going to be a change. What's going to change? Well, when people begin to worship, they usually have their perspective and there's God's perspective. And what worship does is that it changes our perspective into, and this is where the number eight becomes important, because eight is a kingdom number. It's a number of newness. It's a number that reflects, reflects the kingdom character. So we see that worship in the tabernacle was to bring about a change so that people would have the right perspective. So these curtains were 28 cubics, and also its width were four cubics. And four, four, as I've said many times, is the number of the globe, a global significance of the world. And worship brings about a change in the world. When God's creation, I'm speaking about humanity, when we worship God properly, when we agree with God, it is going to bring a change in this world. The tabernacle was to bring a change among all the nations of the world. And that's why we see in the kingdom of God that there's no temple, but it says the tabernacle of the Lord is with man. In the book of Revelation, in the New Jerusalem, no temple. But the tabernacle is mentioned about God's dwelling place. And it's all about the change that the tabernacle, when we study it in the Old Covenant, what we learn from it about this change, a godly change. So its width was four cubics, each curtain, and which means there was one measure for all the curtains. They were all of the same measurements, all 10 of them. Now look at verse, verse 10. There was 10 and they had to be joined together. So he joined five of the curtains, one to another. And then how many was left? Well, five. So the other five curtains. They join one to another. But how did they do that? That was the objective. Well, verse 11 tells us. He made, and this is the leader, he made loops of techelet. Now, we saw what we were talking about in an earlier study. These loops that were placed, and notice what the scripture says. Look again at verse 11. And he made loops of techelet, this this turquoise upon the 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 side of the curtain at one of the ends and what was the purpose for putting these loops there well it says with the joining for the purpose of joining them thus he did at the side of a curtain the edge of the curtain for joining it with the second one so we can understand that at the side of one curtain at the edge were these loops. 
and it was made to attach one to another. But how would you do that with these loops? Well, he's going to tell us in verse verse 12. 50 loops he made for one curtain. So each curtain had 50 loops. 50 loops he made at the edge of the curtain, which was for joining it with the second one. And then we have the word here, Machbilot, which is parallel. So they were joined, what well, we'd see is parallel to one another. That's what he's trying to say. But still, we don't know how they were joined. Well, we learned it earlier, but he's going to tell us again now. So these loops were on one side of each. For what purpose? Join them. But now in verse 13, we learn how. And he made 50. There were 50 loops, so he made 50. And this is the word for, for, some Bibles will say claps, but literally when we studied it earlier, they were hooks, small hooks. So he made 50 hooks of gold. And he joined the curtain, one curtain with another, with these hooks. And because of that, only after join it, and it became one tabernacle. So now we see that joining these, these ten curtains, and ten's an important number. We talked about two tens earlier when we dealt with the number 28. But ten is the number of completion, entirety, wholeness. And what we find is that tabernacle worship was to bring about its objective, was to bring in its entirety the purpose of God into the behavior of the children of Israel. Well, now let's go to verse 14, and we're going to deal a little bit more with the tabernacle, but as I said, the tabernacle had a covering, and we call that covering a tent over the tabernacle. So in one sense, it's a tent covering another tent. And notice what he says, verse 14, And he made for the tent, this tent of covering the tabernacle, he made also these screens or curtains, but these were made not of what we saw earlier, not with this twisted linen and techelet, that turquoise, that unique blue, or that royal purple or, or scarlet, but rather we find here in verse 14, it was made with izim, which is goats, meaning goat hair. So this was the material for the tent that covered the tabernacle. And it was above the tabernacle, over the tabernacle, and how many uh, curtains or screens did this tent have? Well, there's a change. The tabernacle had 10, but the tent over the tabernacle had 11 curtains, and he made them. And the length of one curtain for this tent over the, the tabernacle, here we have a difference. Not 28, but 30 cubics. Now, 30 Again, important number, but before we deal with the significance of that number, realize that it's going to be longer because it's going to extend past for a complete covering. There was one extra cubic on one side and one extra cubic on the other. For a total of two extra, so 28 plus 2, 30. So it was a complete covering. And why 30? Well, 30... It's for the purpose of, of revealing something because it's related to three. But we're going to see another interpretation. 30 can also be related to death. So how do we know how rightly to understand the number 30? He's going to tell us in a moment. Look now to the second part of verse 15. Its, its length were 30 for each curtain, but its width was once more four. Four cubics. Again, this tabernacle, 
all of it had the purpose of bringing change into the world. It says one curtain, its measurement was was one for the 11 curtains. So each one of these 11 curtains had the same measurements. But notice something else, verse 16. And join five of the curtains with itself and six of the curtains with itself. Now, 30 is for the purpose of revealing, but realize something. It's also related to death. And when we worship God, it brings death. Death to what? Ourselves. Our sinful desires. Our objectives. I've shared many times that when we go to a discussion of the Temple Mount, we know that David purchased it for the building of the temple, and there's, of course, a correlation between the temple and the tabernacle. And it was, when David bought that location, it was a threshing floor. And the threshing floor was for the purpose of separating. Separating the, the kernel, the grain, that which is good, from the, the chaff, which is waste. And what it's saying here, worship, Foundationally, is there's things in my life, there's things in your life that we need to get rid of. They need to be separated from us. And those things that need to separate from us, they need to die. We don't go back and pick them up. We don't think about them anymore. If God took them away, leave them separated from us. But we also know five, five, when we look at the Torah, Five has to do, remember when Abraham, he was interceding for for Sodom and Gomorrah? And he says, God, if you find 50 righteous people here, will you destroy the city? Won't you, for the sake of 50 righteous ones, preserve it, have mercy upon it? God says he would. And then Abraham says, well, what if there's five less than 50? Five is lacking. So when we look at the scripture, five is the number of lacking, but six, six is the number of grace. We see how grace relates to, one example of this, is the the angels. When we look, for example, in the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah speaks out when he has that vision of God, and he speaks out saying, woe is me, for I'm a man that's incomplete. A man with unclean lips, meaning defiled. Remember what Yeshua talked about, what comes out of the mouth. Defiles a man, not what goes in. So he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He says, I'm defiled. How does that change? Well, one of those angels that had how many wings? Six. That angel that had six wings went over and took an ember from the the altar, a coal, in other words, and touched the mouth of Isaiah the prophet and atoned for his sin, brought about a change whereby now he was able to serve God. That's what grace does. It makes us able to serve God. So we see here that this 5 and 6 to get to 11, we see that grace overcomes our inadequacy what's lacking in our life grace supplies so that so that we can carry out God's purposes look again verse verse 16 and he joined the five curtains with themselves with the six curtains with themselves but how did he do that the same way verse 17 And he made loops, how many loops? 50, just like the curtains for the tabernacle, so too, with one exception that we'll see in a moment, so too did he join the curtains for the tent that covered the tabernacle, verse 17. And he made 50 loops, 50, we've already talked about 50, having to do with freedom or liberty like the message of the Jubilee year to go free and liberated 
in order to carry out the purposes of God. So he made 50 loops, and in the same way, on one side of the curtain at the end, for what purpose? Join it with the 50 loops that he made upon the side of the other curtain for join it to the second. But here's the difference. Look at verse 18. And by the way, verse 18 is going to be our last verse this evening. Verse 18 tells us once again there's going to be, as I said, some Bible will translate this word as a class, but it's really, as we see it, a hook, a uniquely made hook that joins, that pulls these two loops together so that the curtains become one structure, one large covering for the tabernacle. And that's what the text says, verse verse 18. And he made hooks. But if we go back up to an earlier section, we see that these hooks that were made, look at verse 13, there's 50 of them, but they were hooks of gold. But this was for the tabernacle, the covering, the tent over. Now go to verse 18. It says that he made hooks of nehoshet, copper or bronze. So they were of a different material. But he made 50 of these for joining the tent, for it to become one, one unity. And this one, word one is an important word. We see it, for example, in the book of, of Zechariah chapter 14 in, dis, in displaying truth concerning the kingdom of God, that the name of the Lord will be one and he is one. Speaks about unity, a righteous, godly unity that reflects God's glory. And this describes the kingdom. So in that same way, the tabernacle worship was to manifest the glory of God. Verse 19, I know I said one more verse. Well, let's conclude with this. And he made the mixe. Mixe, in modern Hebrew, it's a lid. It's a covering. This second tent is a covering. He made the, the mixe for the tent. And he made it of ram skins that were dyed red. And the covering that was above it was of skins of tachashim, which was above. Tachashim, as I said last week, we do not know the, the nature of that animal. So we see that the tabernacle and the tent over it had a, a unique structure and it was made of skin skins of rams and these other animal skins that formed a covering so that this this upper covering was made of two types of skins in order that there would be a separation between the the world and the tabernacle and that teaches us our final principle and that is that we cannot be of the world when we worship God. And this says a great deal about our prayer life. Realize that prayer and worship, they go hand in hand. And we cannot have prayers that are rooted in worldly objectives. Now, they may concern things in the world. We may be interceding for things that are happening but our objectives are not worldly related, but kingdom related. We want to see that change, that kingdom change, one person at a time. And through that person, his influence, her influence, would bring kingdom change in some situation, some domain, some location, little by little. That's what we're called to do. And the foundation for bringing this change is a God-pleasing worship. Well, I'll conclude with that until next week when we pick up with verse 20 and we conclude this chapter, the 36th chapter of the book of Exodus. Until that time, shalom.
from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.